Hey everybody, welcome back to The Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today we're going to return to the Dungeon Dive Masterclass series with a return to one of the original greats. And that, of course, is the original Warhammer Quest from 1995. A couple weeks ago, I was kind of revisiting my old deep dive series into Warhammer Quest. And while I am still pretty happy with it, I realized that um, a lot of the presentation could have been better. You know, it, it was my first kind of big series. I think my presentation, I think my voice has gotten better since then. The camera has gotten a little bit better. The lighting has gotten a little bit better. So I kind of wanted to revisit the game. But what I didn't want to do is recreate that original series. I think that series is still valuable. I think people are still enjoying it. I'm not going to delete it or anything. But this series here is going to kind of augment that series. It's going to add on to it. I'm going to approach this series a little differently. I'm going to be talking about the game, about why I think it is still one of my gold standards for this style of game. Some of the information in that old video series will be repeated. Some of it might be changed. I'm, I'm not going back and making sure that everything I say is consistent or anything like that. I mean, my opinions change all the time on things. But we're just going to be taking a look at it. I'm going to be a little bit more critical. This is going to be kind of a more of a long-form review of Warhammer Quest 1995 rather than just a digital museum of all of the things in the game. So when discussing Warhammer Quest 1995 in the context of the Dungeon Dive Masterclass series, I am approaching the game as it exists today. And that is important for a couple of reasons. It is still very much a living game. Not only is it alive still, but it is absolutely thriving. It's one of the most consistently expanded dungeon crawls available thanks to the community at large and thanks to one person specifically, and that is Little Monk. Uh, he has done so much work to continue to make this game really what it is today. But let's address one of the most important things right off the bat, straight out of the gate. Is it worth the crazy collector's prices? And I say, no, it is not. While I think this is a gold standard and one of the very best games in this genre, it is not worth the prices people are asking for on eBay and the various secondary markets. The expansions are super expensive. The warriors are super expensive. The base game goes for like $800 sometimes now I see it. And unless you just have, you know, unless you were just kind of blessed with a lot of money to burn, do not buy Warhammer Quest. There are sources out there to make your own version. And it's not a very complicated build. I'm not going to be giving advice in this video series on where to download things. That's not what this channel is about. But if you're good at Google, if you go to Facebook and join the Warhammer Quest fan page or the Dungeon Dive Facebook group, there are a lot of people out there who can help you uh, design your own, can help you with the files, can point you in the right directions and give you some advice on making a DIY version that would look really, really good. Some of the DIY builds that I've seen people make of Warhammer Quest on the Dungeon Dive, Dungeon Dive group are fantastic. And I would say go down that road if money is ever just even a little bit of an issue. The game, as far as it being a money generating thing for the artists, for the creators, that part of the game is dead. So I see no problem in making your own DIY version with the files out there that are available. So why is Warhammer Quest still a gold standard, in my opinion? Why, after nearly 30 years, is this still a game that I measure new games by? There are so few games that are released that even attempt to do what this game did. It, it actually presents a perfect roadmap for a modern game designer, for a modern game company to follow, but so few do. And there is a huge Warhammer Quest shaped void in this hobby. There are really only two games that have come out since Warhammer Quest 
that even attempt to do what this game did. One of those is Darklight Memento Mori, which is a Warhammer Quest derivative, but now that game is completely out of print and expensive. And it didn't quite offer up the, not the depth, but the scope of Warhammer Quest. And then there is, of course, Shadows of Brimstone, which is very much alive and thriving. And that game gets really, really close, especially if you add in the fan expansion for the Hex, the, uh, Hex Crawl expansion. It gets really close to Warhammer Quest and maybe kind of outshines Warhammer Quest in some other in some areas. But if you start adding in a whole bunch of expans uh, expansions for Shadows of Brimstone, it does also become a very, very expensive game. Warhammer Quest is a highly coveted game, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so shocked that nobody has really attempted to make a modern version that is readily available and one that they could make some money on and one that they could continue to uh, support in the uh, from now into the future. So it has basically all of the things that I crave, the things that I look for in a dungeon crawl board game. At the top of that list is the style of campaign that Warhammer Quest provides. And that is what I call a survival campaign or a persistent character campaign. In survival campaigns, you are just trying to keep your character alive in order to go on more quests to get more gold, more loot, and more experience to make your character stronger so they can survive more and more deadly quests, rinse and repeat. Warhammer Quest is a different kind of campaign than what most games provide as a campaign these days. We have dozens of games coming out on Kickstarter every year that are these big epic campaign games. But what they really are is you as the players in those in, in most of those games, you are passively experiencing a story already written by somebody else. You are reading about characters doing things. You are reading about your characters going to certain places and doing certain things. You are not in charge of the story. The story is not yours. You are just kind of experiencing it while you are basically reading a choose your own adventure narrative in between sessions of dungeon crawling or adventure gaming. Warhammer Quest's campaign is kind of the opposite of that. The narrative that it provides is slim to none. I mean, you get one or two paragraphs for each quest and you get some paragraphs of traveling from quest to quest and paragraphs of things that you might do in a settlement in between quests. But most of the story, most of the narrative that evolves while you are playing the game comes from the action on the table. It comes from the game players, the players creating the story together or solo, connecting the dots, coming up with the things, the details that we fill in while we are playing based on the things that are actually happening at the table. So it's not a passive story, it is an active story. And that is what I enjoy out of the kinds of games that I like to play. When I want to have a passive experience, when I want to read about characters doing things, I'll turn to a novel because novels are always way better written than game stories. But when I want to have something, when I want to play a story, I want to be in control of the details. I want to be in control of the cool things that happen. And I want to create the adventure myself. And that is what Warhammer Quest provides. It also has random dungeons with meaningful exploration. It's really kind of odd how few dungeon crawl games there are that actually allow you to build a random dungeon while you are playing. There are fewer still that have meaningful exploration. And Warhammer Quest does a really good job of creating that illusion of exploration. And the way it does it is very simple. There are times while you are exploring a dungeon where the deck of dungeon cards will split and you have to make a choice to go left or right, north or south, east, east or east or west. And when you make that decision, there is a chance that you are going to cut yourself off from that quest objective and you will have to abandon that quest 
without fulfilling the quest objective. And that is really an important aspect in these kinds of games that is often missing from a lot of examples of these kinds of games. It has a ton of random encounters, both combat and non-combat. And that's another thing that a lot of dungeon crawls out there, they really get wrong, is they don't offer enough things to do in the dungeon beyond fighting. And in Warhammer Quest, a lot of the times, the things that happen outside of combat are actually far more deadly and far more interesting and far more fun than the things that happen in combat. You can play the same quest a multiple times with totally different outcomes. There are 30 quests in the main quest book, and each of those quests is, is dead simple. So usually it's go in and destroy a boss or go in and retrieve an item for an NPC and get out. But because of all the random elements, because of the, the way that the dungeon evolves randomly, the, because of the exploration, because of the random events, you could play the same quest multiple times and have completely different kinds of adventure. And that is another thing that I really, really enjoy. It also has interesting, persistent characters with meaningful progression through gaining loot and skills. And that is the main thrust of Warhammer Quest is having your character survive, having your character grow, having your character gain some gold so they can uh, buy levels and learn new skills, and also having your character find treasure in the dungeon so they can get that really cool gear. And the really cool thing about the loot in Warhammer Quest is that it is not um, it's not tiered. So you have a chance to, every time you go into one of those dungeons, you have a chance to find any weapon and you can use any weapon as long as you have the right class. The weapons are tiered kind of as far as like the class or the, the warrior type, but you don't have to worry about being level two, three, four, or five in order to use a weapon. And that is always kind of a bummer. It's one of my uh, things that I don't like about Dungeon Crusade. I don't like the tiered loot system. When I play Dungeon Crusade now, if my level one hero finds a level three weapon in a chest, I just I just use it having to wait to hit level three to use that cool weapon, in my opinion, kind of defeats the point of that loot because by the time you reach level three, by the time you're able to use that weapon, the monsters have also grown more powerful. And so it's just kind of like this power creep. You don't feel more powerful because the things you are facing are also more powerful. What's cool about games like Warhammer Quest and Secrets of the Lost Tomb, another game in my Masterclass series, is you can find an incredibly amazing weapon, uh, amazing weapon in your first dungeon. And at level one, the monsters are going to be weak and you can use that super powerful weapon to just mow down monsters left and right. It is super fun. And I, I love that chance of being overpowered in games like this. Another thing that Warhammer Quest does that a lot of games don't do is it provides things to do for the characters, for the players that exist outside of the dungeon. In Warhammer Quest, we have travel events where we are traveling to and from dungeons. Each quest, you go into a dungeon, and then after the quest, you have to travel to a settlement. You can go to a village, a town, or a city, and depending on which you choose, you will have to travel certain distances, and you will roll up on charts to have different things happening to your, uh, your adventurer, your warrior, and this is where those dots start to uh, appear, and this is where you can start to connect the dots uh, to kind of fill in the gaps, fill in the narrative of what is happening to your characters as they travel from one quest to another, from one settlement to another. When you get to the settlements, there are different buildings you can go to, different businesses, different things can happen. There are different events, random events that happen in the settlement that just add to this feeling of this game existing in a living, breathing world. And that is one of the coolest things about Warhammer Quest. One of the main things that games like Dark Light Memento Mori and Shadows of Brimstone uh, kind of stole from Warhammer Quest is that that the way that it uses travel events and settlement events to create this kind of thriving, living, almost kind of persistent world in between games. And that has to be one of my absolute favorite parts about the game. 
And it also has that role play book. And we're going to take a, a, a detailed look at that role play book. And that is such an important aspect of this game. It takes the very basic game that you play when you're first learning the game and completely expands it in every single way, adding to that a huge number of spells, a massive bestiary. Uh, this game has one of the most complex or one of the most comprehensive bestiaries ever in a dungeon crawl it has a ton of things to discover of uh, various ways to play the game you can play the game with a game master you can turn it into a an okay very simple rpg or you can use some of those rpg elements to embellish your solo games to make them a little more impactful in how your character interacts with the world that they are in Another bonus to the game is its super simplistic rules. And I think that goes a long way in explaining the game's longevity. It's a very easy game to learn. It's a very easy game to play. And because the rules are so light and so basic, it is also a very easy game to expand. It is an easy game to add your own stuff to. And that is one of the reasons why the game is still thriving. It's kind of like this chicken and egg scenario. Is Warhammer Quest a gold standard because of the fan created content, because of the house rules and because of all of the expansions fans have added or have fans added all of that material because it is a gold standard. And but that they, they all stem from the game being very simplistic. It has a very easy foundation upon which you can build and you can flesh out and you can really mold it to become the kind of game that you want to play and experience. However, just because I consider this to be a gold standard, that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, very few games, if any, are perfect. And there are some issues with it. And there are some things that some people just aren't going to like, no matter how much people like us praise it. And I don't really argue with them for the most part, because it is a particular kind of dungeon crawl that appeals to a certain kind of player. The game has some extreme power creep and it kind of breaks down as your heroes grow in power. It's really hard to balance a game like this and keep it interesting. So that is why a lot of modern games tier, put their loot and their monsters in tiers. Whereas a game like this doesn't do that, but it does, you do run into that power creep. Once you get past about level five, the monsters have so many abilities. You have a ton of abilities and loot and all, there's so much to keep track of that the game just kinds of get, it, it kind of gets bogged down in a lot of nitty gritty details. And the fun can sometimes be lost when you are having to deal with so many things that creep in as your characters get more in, in higher and higher levels. There's a sweet spot to play this game. And that's about levels one through five. Anything after that, I would say just kind of retire your characters at level five and maybe start over with some level one characters. It is also a game that needs some expansion. So it needs those official expansions and it needs that fan created material. This game would not be... It wouldn't be the game it is today without all of those decades of fan created uh, supplements and expansions. The combat can be tedious. There isn't a lot of movement around the battlefield. There aren't a lot of tactics. There isn't a lot of strategy once the combat starts. You know, Darklight Memento Mori, I think, really kind of addressed that situation with the dodging and the rolling, kind of turning it into a weird kind of like Dark Souls board game. And the, the combat in Warhammer Quest might be my least favorite thing about it. I am kind of working on some new house rules that I'm going to apply to Shadows of Brimstone and to Warhammer Quest to maybe simplify the combat or abstract the combat a little more to make it quicker and more fun for me. We'll probably not talk about that so much in this video series, but I am going to talk about that in a upcoming series I'm doing on Shadows of Brimstone, playing that as a solo RPG.
Some players will also complain about the lack of player agency and choice in certain areas. And while I cannot disagree with that, it doesn't bother me um, personally. I it, It's not something that I really care about. I'm more about the feel of a game, the vibe. I'm more about the adventure, the story that I create, the things that happen. And a lot of the things that happen in Warhammer Quest happen because of certain uh, rolls of a d6. If you roll a lot of ones, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen to you. If you roll a lot of sixes, a lot of good stuff is going to happen to you. And that's kind of out of your hands. There isn't a lot of luck mitigation in this game. And I like that. I like the crazy random things that happen just because of the random draw of a card that I have no say in whatsoever. To me, it's those random elements. It's that lack of player agency that elevates the game to that gold standard. But a lot of modern game players, they have no patience for something like that. They want something more akin to Gloomhaven or Sword and Sorcery or Mage Knight. And for people who think those games are a gold standard, they're not going to find a lot to love about this game. And that's completely fine. This game is made for a certain crowd, a certain type of gamer, and those other games are made for other types of, uh, other types of gamers. And that is perfectly understandable. And I really can't say anything to, uh, to convince somebody that no, no, this game actually does have tons of strategy and tons of player agency. And, and like, yeah, don't even worry about the luck. There, the, you don't need to worry about the random elements. You can totally mitigate those away. No, you're going to have a bad time sometimes. You roll a, a one and you don't make it across the, a, a bridge and your character just dies. You're going to die a lot in this game and you're going to die a lot, not because of bad choices you made, but because of bad luck. And that's just something that happens in this game. If you like things like that, you're going to love it. If you don't, then no amount of convincing will change your mind. Okay, so now we're going to go down, we're going to take a kind of a detailed look at what you get in the base game. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the components, some of the cards, and then uh, that'll be the end of this first episode. And then there's going to be a handful of episodes after this. We're going to be taking a look at all the expansions, the official expansions, the two big box expansions, and some of the warrior expansions. And then we'll take a brief look at some of the white dwarf issues and the death blow issues one to three. And then we'll talk about some of the DIY stuff. So this is probably going to be about a five episode master class series. Any serious look at Warhammer Quest that doesn't start with a look at the box is just a wasted effort. Uh, this artwork created by Jeff Taylor is one of the all-time great pieces of fantasy gaming art. If I saw a box like this in any game store today, I would immediately pick it up and make my way to the counter without really looking into much more. I mean, this thing just screams epic, awesome fantasy adventure time. The only issue with it is where's the dwarf we've got the barbarian we've got the wizard we've got the elf but the dwarf is nowhere to be found that is a real bummer but um yeah they just they just don't make covers like this anymore this just gets me so excited to experience the world within and games work games workshop is is just so good at that. Their, their new uh, Warhammer Quest boxes also look great, and they just they they know how to draw the eye to their products. The same can also be said about the back of this box. This looks like a product that the designers, the publisher, the creators, the artists were proud of. This picture here, this spread of everything out on the table is one of my favorite photos in all of game marketing. If you could have a favorite photo in game marketing, this thing just, it looks so incredible set up. It looks like how I feel when I am playing the game. There is so much excitement going on here. It shows you everything that you get all set up. I do actually appreciate the fact that they don't show everything painted like they do on their new games. This showed a true depiction of what 
probably most people's games look like with the sea of gray. But even this game with the sea of gray still looks really, really cool. Uh, yeah, this, I would love this as a poster. I just think that looks so cool. So let's see, this says a Warhammer quest is the game of battle, magic, and adventure in the danger-ridden caverns of the Warhammer world. You take part of the heroic warriors as they explore the caves and tunnels, vanquishing terrifying monsters and avoiding deadly traps in their quest for treasure and glory. And then you get an amazing detailed look of everything you get in this box. This box contains uh, everything you need to start playing Warhammer Quest. You get the rule books, all of your cards, your uh, markers, your floor plans, and all of these Citadel miniatures that you're going to get, including your four warrior models. So yeah, this, this is how you create a box for a game. This is how you draw a potential buyer's uh, attention to your product. So in the box, the main thing you're going to be uh, looking at is probably your rule books. And again, I love the size of these GW books. I think they are great. You're going to get your, get, your uh, getting started guide, which is just a kind of a quick overview of how to play the game, a nice little kind of black and white pamphlet that is going to walk you see walk you through some of the initial steps to uh, to learning the game and then you're going to get your very basic rule book again this is a very easy game to learn it is at most I'll see uh, 32 pages there with a lot of art and of course the game was uh, designed by Andy Jones it has internal art by John Blanche Wayne England Dave Gallagher and Mark Gibbons and uh, the box cover, of course, by uh, Jeff Taylor there. And then on the inside covers, you're going to get a little story about the barbarian, the dwarf, your four main warriors there, the elf and the wizard. I love the wizard in this game. These old GW battle mages that look as strong with a sword as they do with magic. I love that. That is so cool. But the game, you have your introduction. It's a really nice story here. Uh, it is time of battle and magic where wizards and warriors must fight for survival against implacable foes. It is also an age of adventure where fame and fabulous wealth lie waiting for those brave enough to seek them. In Warhammer Quest, each player takes the role of a warrior, one of the four brave adventurers willing to test their courage and search for wealth and glory. Each hero comes from a different people. The barbarian has traveled far from the savage north, a land bitter of cold and ferocious warriors. The wizard hails from the cities of the empire, the largest and most important of the realms of men. The dwarf is drawn by the gold lust for which his race is famous. Dwarfs are grim and rather abrupt, but they are good fighters and loyal friends who remember depths of gratitude as readily as depths of coin. The elf comes from the green woods of Lauren, where his kin spend their days hunting and making merry, protected from evil by the strange magic of their land. Elves are incredibly quick and agile, and they are also the best archers in the world. And then it goes over everything that you're going to get in your box, a little bit of the uh, detail on the tiles here, your monsters that you're going to get, your orc warriors, orc archers, your snotlings, skavens, giant rats, goblin spearmen, night goblin archers, giant spiders, giant bats, and the minotaur. It'll go over your spell cards, the dice that come with the game, your various decks of cards, some of your adventure sheets, your rule book, adventure book, the role play book, your various card markers uh, that you're going to get, and some of the tokens that you will also get here. And then a breakdown of all the components. Again, a nice little piece of flavor text there. It's going to go into the details of the warriors, what your different stats mean, your wounds, your movement, your weapon skill, your ballistic skill, your strength, toughness, initiative, and attacks. A breakdown of the cards that come with the uh, game detailing the four basic warriors and then how to start a game, how to divvy out your starting equipment and how to play the game, your various phases, your power phase, the wizard rolls a one phase, of course, your warriors phase, the monsters phase and the exploration phase there. And then it goes into a detailed look at each of the phases 
and how to accomplish the goals in each one of those. And finally, what happens when you reach your objective room at the end of each dungeon. And then we get into a detailed examination of how combat works. Combat is very easy. You roll a D6, you add some bonuses, you try to hit a target number or above. If you do, you hit, then you roll for damage. And the monster might have some armor or toughness that will negate some of the damage. And then we go into your golden treasure, uh, some details on healing, what happens when your warriors die, a couple examples of combat, and also a detailed, looking, a detailed look at spell casting. And then your to hit chart that you can use if you need it. And also your basic uh, stats for your basic enemies there. It's very simple. On the back here, you also have your enemy cards that you can take a look at if you need to. Uh, it, it's presented well. The rules are simple. There are a lot of details that the rules don't cover that come in with the cards, but that's kind of the nature of the game. But I think the rule book does a really good job of teaching the game. And most importantly, because it does a good job of teaching it also with the flavor text and the stories and the excitement, it also gets the players pumped for the adventure. And speaking of adventure, then we get the adventure book here, and this is going to be your basic quest book. Uh, the quest you will select by rolling, you can roll a D6 or you can choose at random, you can choose one of the five objective rooms. That is where your quest is going to terminate. And then each one of those objective rooms has six different quests associated with it. Once in the basic game, once you uh, reach the objective room, you will roll on this little chart here and that will determine what you face in that, uh, in that particular objective room. So you have the fighting pit there and then we have the fire chasm and we have the fountain of light, the tomb chamber, the idol chamber and then what happens if you need to escape if your way gets blocked off and you can't make it to your objective room different ways that you will have to escape from the dungeon without completing your quest and what happens because of that and then you also get some details on creating your own event cards with some event cards that you can photocopy of course you could also buy packs of, of blank event cards and then you get a nice little overview of some of the phases here and again you get a to hit chart that you can photocopy and an adventure record sheet and then here you get a play sheet of the various uh, a various a, a pretty detailed player aid the quests, like I said in the introduction, are very simple, and because of that, they don't have a lot of narrative, but you get to bring to the game the kind of narrative that you want to create by connecting the dots with all the random elements that happen during play. So this is a very basic quest here, like the beast. And this takes place in the fighting pit. A dim light of a single lamp suspended from the ceiling barely penetrates the shadows of this dark and forbidding room. And this is the quest. The beast captured by the goblin war warlord Urgul Headsticka. While exploring the ruins of Carrick Osgul, the warriors have been given a chance to escape and in the process provide entertainment for the goblins. The warriors must fight their way to freedom without weapons or armor. And as if that were not enough, their only way out is through the Minotaur's lair. So that would have to do that is kind of like the setup of the quest. Then you're going to get your special rules. What happens when you reach the fighting pit? And then uh, also what happens if you escape? Again, each one of the quests, while they are very basic, they can be played multiple times. You will want to play them multiple times because different things will happen because of all the various random elements. And then finally, we get to the book that elevates Warhammer Quest above all the others. The book that makes this one of the greatest kind of like boxed products of all time, the role play book. This book right here completely changes the game. And this is the book. This is the stuff that really no other game has even attempted to provide within its core box. And I'm not sure why. Well, I actually probably am sure why. It's a lot of work. This thing is massive. It's, uh, what is it? It's almost 200 pages and it contains so much cool material and so many different ways to play the game, so many options. 
that it's just, yeah, it's just, it's such a wonderful, wonderful book. It's one of my favorite gaming books. I actually have two copies. Sometimes you can get really lucky by just searching regular old Amazon for Warhammer Quest stuff. I found somebody selling a used copy of the roleplay book in perfect condition for $20 a couple years ago. So I actually have a, a backup copy just in case something ever happens to this copy, just because I love it so much. And here you have your advanced rules, your rules on linking games of, of having your, persist, your persistent characters, of traveling from dungeons to settlements and from experiencing things in settlements and things that happen between the adventures, your various hazards. You're also going to get new uh, traps and new events to encounter in the dungeons. You're going to get a huge bestiary, a huge list of spells, different ways to outfit your character, new weapons, magical weapons, and a whole chapter on on uh, leveling up your heroes, your warriors, and gaining new skills. And then a whole GM section that also comes with a three-level dungeon that you can run for other players. And uh, yeah, this book is just so incredible. I can only imagine what people must have thought when they got this book and when they got this game to begin with. Even today, this is something of like a miraculous thing. And I just, I, like I said before, I am so surprised that uh, something like this isn't made for other games, especially with Kickstarter, where people could throw a lot of money at a company to make something like this for a game. And even with that kind of, uh, even with that capability, designers still aren't doing it. You get a whole bunch of new things that you can buy for your heroes, uh, your warriors, such as armor and different kinds of arrows there, different weapons, um, animals, the general store, the gunsmith. And then here we get into our chapter on tougher monsters, how to use the monster table. And here is an example of a level one monster table there with all of the different kinds of monsters. Of course, GW wanted you to use the official Citadel miniatures in order to represent those monsters. But if you're like me, you just use a whole bunch of proxies. Uh, Massive Darkness 1 and 2 are, are great. The wandering monsters in that are great for some of the more powerful monsters. And I keep a lot of the games and minis that I've collected over the years, I keep just because of Warhammer Quest. We get a little bit into some psychology such as fear and hatred, different things that are going to affect the way the monsters treat your heroes. Here we get into the warrior development going up in battle levels. And what happens when you get more powerful so you have to make the objective rooms more dangerous in order to keep the, uh, the, the challenge up there. And then the cost of training of leveling up your heroes. And then here we get our charts for the different levels and what they will gain as they go up in levels. You have your barbarian, your dwarf, your elf, and your wizard. Those are your four ba basic classes there. And then all of your various skills that you can learn, your barbarian skills, dwarf skills, elf skills and the wizard's training the wizard's training is a little different because the wizard is going to be gaining spells and this game comes with a ton of different spells that your wizard can learn and some of them get very very powerful and very deadly we also have a whole new list of dungeon events so these can take place of the event cards because you're going to be seeing the basic event cards over and over again after you've played a few times and so this adds a whole a uh, new set of D66 events that you can encounter within the dungeons. On top of that, you also get new treasure tables. And these are going to be new things that you can find in the basic dungeon rooms there. So kind of more basic treasure. D66 table there. And then also a D66 table for more powerful weapons and gear and items that you can find in the objective rooms after you defeat one of the big bosses. And then we get to the bestiary, one of the greatest bestiaries in all of Dungeon Crawl Gaming. You get so many different special rules, different abilities that the monsters can have, and then you get a whole list of monsters that are separated into the major categories like Chaos, Chaos Dwarves, Dark Elves, different monsters, Orcs and Goblins, and Skaven. So, so many different monsters. It's very well organized. All of the special rules are in alphabetical order. So it's pretty easy to find. And even though you are going to be, 
you're, you're, you're going to be referring to this book a lot until you memorize and I have never memorized any of these. So I'm always referring to this book. I actually found a PDF of this book online. I think it was on Scribd and I printed out the whole bestiary section and spiral bound it. So that way I have a, a book that I can easily access while I am playing. And then here we get all of the stats of all of the monsters and all of their various powers and the ways to encounter them. Again, just a fantastic bestiary. This thing, this section alone elevates this game to such a high, high standard. I absolutely love it. We'll flip through here. And then here we get into our level, uh, our, our monster table. So as your heroes level up, you will be rolling on more and more powerful tables. We have level one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight. So they get more and more complex as they go. As you can see, the monsters start adding more and more special abilities, which means a lot more upkeep from turn to turn. And so that's kind of where the power creep comes in and where it just becomes really hard to kind of manage. I have never even reached close to level 10. I can't even imagine playing this game at level 10. I think I would want somebody else to run the monsters for me. Uh, Little Monk, if you want to come over and do that for me someday, you can. <laughs> And then here we get into our role play section, and this talks a little bit about the role of the game master, how to play this game as a role playing game, uh, how to handle secrets and trap doors. You get a typical turn uh, of how to run this game as an RPG, how to do various kinds of encounters here. What is role playing? Nice little section on on all of that, on all of your basic kind of role playing background. And then here's you get here is your your handy chart where you get examples of warriors actions of different things that you can do that you can kick things over. You can jump, you can leap, you can lift a trap door, make rope, pick a lock, play dead, starting fire, stunning enemies, buffy, uh, bluffing enemies climb on shoulders, climb wall. So all kinds of different things to do with different target numbers and bonuses, depending on the type of warrior you are playing, the, the stat that you're going to use to test that ability and some notes on that ability. I like to use this in my solo games just to add a little bit of interaction between my warriors and the worlds in which they are living and the dungeons they are exploring. And then here we get a, a new character class, the Troll Slayer, a full character class here, complete with all of their abilities and level up bonuses. And then here we have our, our Game Master-led uh, adventure, Death Below Karak Osgol. And this sets up the, this is kind of a chapter one that is continued in the main uh, orc expansion. And so this is a three level dungeon that a game master can lead a party of characters through. So yeah, just super, super cool. I love this book so much. So the minis you're going to get, you're going to get a four uh, minis for your heroes. I've painted three of them. I still need to paint my dwarf. I think I said that five years ago when I did my original series. You can see how much I love painting. Uh, but you're going to get your barbarian. You're going to get your wizard and your elf. And then, of course, your uh, your dwarf there. And then you're going to get, uh, of course, minis for your various monster groups. So you will get your uh, your minotaur. Here is your orc with a sword and orc with a bow. And then you will, of course, get your snotling here, your goblin and a knight goblin there. And then, of course, your skavens. I love these old skaven models. And then your beasts here. You will get a bat, a giant spider and your giant rats and these things man these things really suck when they team up on you they can be very 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 deadly do not underestimate the power of a group of giant rats and then you also get your uh connecting your, your uh doors that will connect these certain rooms the guy who i bought my set from he made this custom portcullis uh door here which is really cool you'll get a whole bunch of these so you can connect your various floor tiles and speaking of floor tiles these floor tiles are very kind of generic but i think that's kind of the point because these floor tiles are supposed to represent a whole bunch of different kinds of dungeons so you will get uh your t junctions and your uh corners there you will get your passages 
you will get six different dungeon rooms. And the dungeon rooms are kind of a little more special. Something special will usually happen in a dungeon room. They will usually have an event associated with it. And then, of course, you will get your objective rooms. And these are your big kind of final rooms where you're going to be facing off against the boss. And this is where your quest is going to terminate in there. And as far as cards go, you don't get a ton of cards, but remember the cards in the base set are augmented by the various charts, the expanded charts in the role-playing book. Some of these cards I'm going to show you are actually facsimiles made by Little Monk. If you join the Warhammer Quest Facebook, uh, the Warhammer Quest fan page on Facebook, uh, every once in a while, I think he's done two print runs. He does these print runs of a lot of the cards, of like all of the cards from the base game, the expansions, and then all of the cards from these sets that he has made, the expansions that he has made. And so he has gone through and like kind of touched up, rebalanced, rewritten. Uh, some of the cards so these are the event cards that you're going to get in your base set these are the main cards your cave in dead bodies different encounters different things to to find and then also your monster cards for when you draw a monster this gives you your stats of the various monsters you're going to uh, to go up against your basic treasure deck here the basic treasure deck is a little boring but again it is augmented by two d66 charts in the role play book these are all kinds of different things that you will find that will allow your warriors to gain either more magic, more potions, shields, and weapons, and different kinds of armor. And then you will get your dungeon cards. With your dungeon cards, you'll have cards for all of your various corridors, your junctions there, and then your, uh, your various dungeon rooms and your objective rooms. You will also get a few cards to represent some of your starting and low level spells. The other spells you will just have to write down from the book here. But these uh, represent some of the spells that your wizard can learn. And then you will also get some of uh, little cards for your starting gear. Now, depending on regardless of what heroes what warriors you play you will always at least start with these in addition to any other starting weapons because they are at least a rope and the lantern always take a rope and lantern with you never start an adventure of warhammer quest without a rope that is like Key number one to a successful <laughs> first adventure, always bring a rope. Just when you start the game, just always start with the rope and lantern. That is the best advice I can give you. And then you have your healing potion and your hand of death scroll. And then you will also get cardboard uh, cards for your four basic heroes, your four basic warriors, your barbarian, and then the barbarian from levels two through ten, your elf and then your elf advancement card, your wizard and a wizard advancement card, and your dwarf and your dwarf advancement card. But yeah, that is basically everything that you get in the base set for Warhammer Quest. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this first video of the Warhammer Quest Masterclass series. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at all of the official expansion stuff that I have. We will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye.